trilobite guts and evolution. We will start with an article by, uh, in Science Daily. It does not have an author. It's simply entitled, Early Tri Trilobites Had Stomachs, New Fossil Study Finds. And uh, you may be thinking, what? Um, but there was a belief, and we'll go over that as the, we'll let the picture emerge from the text that we'll be reading, uh, that it turns out that uh, trilobites were thought at one time not to have stomachs until quite late. The uh, subtitle is Remarkable Chinese Specimens Contradict Previous Assumptions About Trilobite Digestive Systems and Evolution. Uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, this came out in September 21 of 2017, so we're, uh, we're pretty up to date on this. And like med many of the things that we've been talking about in Sabbath School, it is available on the internet. A summary that they give is exceptionally preserved trilobite fossils from China dating back to more than 500 million years ago have revealed new insight into the extinct marine animals' digestive system. The uh, new study shows that at least two trilobite species evolved a stomach structure 20 million years earlier than previously thought. 20 million years out of 500 million years doesn't sound like a lot, but what it does is it, it upsets the evolutionary timeline. This photo, which we're going to show you next, is of a specimen of the trilobite uh, Paleolinus uh, lenantoisi from the, I should have looked to see whether it was italicized in the original, from the Guanshan biota in southern Yunnan province, China. Rarely are internal organs pres preserved in fossils, but this specimen shows the digestive system preserved as reddish iron oxides. The digestive system is comprised of a crop, inflated region at the top of the specimen, lateral glands, I'm just gonna tell you that I have it turned 90 degrees so the top is left when you read this, uh, lateral glands and a central canal that runs along the length of the body. The iron oxides that extend beyond the fossil are the remains of gut contacts that were extruded during preservation. And there's the uh, fossil which uh, you can see the this a, uh, what they're calling a crop. And if you look right here and here, and there's actually a little one up here too, uh, and on the other side, there are little glands that stick out on the sides. Um, at least that's how they're interpreted. We obviously don't have the original, so it's hard to be absolutely sure, but kind of looks that way and pretty much everybody's interpreting it that way. And then the rest of the gut continues on, and you can see it goes all the way out to here. And it looks like this particular trilobite um, was pooping as it died. Because you can see feces coming out the back end. Anyway, you'll recognize that uh, it forms the background of our uh, talk today. Um, uh, exceptionally preserved trilobite fossils from China dating back to more than 500 million years ago have revealed new insights into the extinct marine animals digestive system. Published today, so that was September, in the journal PLOS One, the new study shows that at least two trilobite species evolved a stomach structure 20 million years earlier than previously thought. It's actually worse than that as we'll find out. Trilobites are one of the first type of animals to show up in large numbers in the fossil record, said lead author Melanie Hopkins, an assistant curator in the Division of Paleontology at the American Museum of Natural History. Their exoskeletons were heavy in minerals, so they were preserved really well. But like all fossils, it's very rare to see the preservation of soft tissues like organs or appendages in trilobites. And because of this, our knowledge of the trilobite digestive system comes from a small number of specimens. The new material in this study really expands our understanding. They found, um, turns out there are hundreds of thousands of trilobite fossils and there's probably about 10,000 that are described in the literature. And there's only about 42 that have any, uh, have enough traces of a gut for you to be able to say for sure that this is the gut. So 42 specimens, 
well, used to be 40, I guess, and is now 42. So that gives you some idea of uh, how difficult it is to find these. Trilobites are an a group of extinct marine arthropods distantly related to the horseshoe crab that has a bigger head uh, that lived for almost 300 million years. They were extremely diverse with about 20,000 species and their fossil exoskeletons can be found all around the world. Most of the 270 specimens analyzed in the new study were collected from a quarry in southern Kunming, China during an excavation led by Hopkins co-author Zifei Zhang from Northwest University in Qian. Apologize to the Chinese people listening to this. Previous research uh, suggests that two body plans existed for trilobite digestive systems. A tube that runs down the length of the trilobite's body with lateral digestive glands that would have helped process the food or an expanded stomach called a crop leading into a simple tube with no lateral glands. So you could have one or the other, but not both. Uh, until now, only the first type had been reported from the oldest trilobites, that is, the, the glands on the side. Based on this, researchers had proposed that the evolution of the crop came later in trilobite evolutionary history and represented a distinct type of digestive system. You see, you have first the simple and then the more complex. Although, in my mind, the crop is simpler than the glands alongside, but we'll leave that for now. Obviously, the glands must be simpler because they came first. Um, the, trilobite, the Chinese trilobite fossils, about 20% of which had soft tissue preservation, are dated to the early Cambrian about 514 million years ago. Contradictory to the previously proposed body plans, the researchers identified crops in two different species within this material. In addition, they found a single specimen that has both a crop and digestive glands, suggesting that the evolution of the trilobite digestive system is more complex than originally proposed. I've heard that theme before somewhere. Uh, the study backs up an earlier announcement made by a separate research team which found evidence for the unusual crop and gland pairing in a single juvenile trilobite species specimen from Sweden from the late Cambrian. Um, but that one, you know, was a juvenile and doesn't count. Okay, but the Chinese material presents the oldest example of this complex digestive system in a mature trilobite wiping away doubts that the dual structures might just be part of the animal's early development. No, they had both from the beginning, or at least from very close to the beginning. As we'll find out, it isn't the precise beginning, but it's very close. Um, then there's another article in Live Science, which is another kind of science popular uh, uh, magazine. Uh, on the internet, and it's called Trilobite Tummies Revealed in New Fossils. And this one does have an author, Stephanie Pappas, live science contributor, and again, September 25, so again, it's pretty close to the release of the paper. And again, it is also on the internet. Um, trilobite tummies were more complex than previously believed, new fossils reveal. The fossils which hail from China preserve the guts of trilobites in long, iron-rich strips. Trilobite fossils are a dime a dozen, sort of like the cockroaches of the sea in that respect. And we're going to get an idea of just how many trilobite fossils there are. They were abundant for nearly 300 million years before they went extinct for about 252 million years ago. Uh, but trilobite fossils that reveal internal organs are rare, according to a new study on the fossils published September 21 in the journal PLOS One. Well, they're rare period. Uh, it's just that the study pointed that out. The fossils showed that early trilobites had crops or stomach-like pouches that were once thought to have evolved only later in the trilobite lineage. One trilobite species even boasted a crop along with more simplified digestive glands. More simplified? Well, they came earlier, they must have been more simplified, but whatever. Suggesting that the evolution of the trilobite digestive system was complicated, the researchers found. Actually, 
it looks like they were complicated at the beginning, and if anything, they devolved. But um, complicated guts. Until now, researchers thought that there were two types of trilobites, those with crops and those without. The second type had a long tube from the mouth to the anus that was lined with digestive glands that would have squirted juices to help digestion. Sort of like the human pancreas uh, and uh, gallbladder squirting juices into the human system. Uh, in contrast, those with crops had a stomach-like pouch where food would break down, but they had no additional digestive glands. However, there was one specimen analyzed in 2012, and that's online if you want to check it, that seemed to have both, but that was a juvenile. So re researchers weren't sure whether the digestive system was the same as what would have been seen in an adult of the same species. Otherwise, most species with crops were from younger rocks that's, than species with gut tubes, uh, with or without the pouches. So trilobite researchers thought that perhaps crops were a late evolutionary addition. The new research suggests otherwise. Using fossils found in a rock layer called Guanshan Biota of southern China, researchers from American Museum of Natural History, New York, Northwest University in Xi'an, China, and the Chengdu Institute of Geology and Mineral Resources found crops in the trilobite species uh, Radicia, Radicia mensui and Paleolinus lantinoisi, which is the one that, the last one is the one that you saw the picture of. That one had both a crop and digestive glands, they reported. The trilobite diet, these crops, uh, crop bearing fossils date back 514 million years to the beginning of the Cambrian period. This is a very rigorous study based on multiple specimens, and it shows that we should start thinking about this aspect of trilobite biology and evolution in a different way. So we're going to do that at the end. Study leader Melanie Hopkins of the AMNH said in a statement. Now, I'm going to skip over the last paragraph because it's not particularly relevant. We're not trying to be complete so much as to point out the most important stuff. And here's the article that got all the excitement. Hopkins MJ, that's the first author, Melanie Hopkins, and Chen, Hu, and Zhang, Zhang. The oldest known digestive system consisting of both paired digestive glands and a crop from exceptionally preserved trilobites from the Gunshan biota, early Cambrian in China. And uh, it's in PLOS One. And again, um, it's so new, well, actually, I think PLOS, PLOS One doesn't have page numbers, they just have addresses. And it, again, it's available online too. The abstract, this is a third of the abstract, we'll read the whole thing. The early Cambrian Guanshan biota of eastern Yunnan, China. Uh, some of you may remember Yunnan, China has quite a bit of Cambrian stuff in it. Uh, contains exceptionally preserved al animals and algae. Most diverse and abundant are the arthropods, of which there are at least 11 species of trilobites represented by numerous specimens. Many trilobite specimens show soft body preservation via iron oxide pseudomorphs, a, py a pyrite replacement. Here we described digestive structures from two species of trilobite, Paleolinus lantinoisi and uh, Redlichia mansui. Multiple specimens of both species contain the preserved remains of an expanded stomach region, a crop, under the glabella. And if you're wondering what the glabella is, well, the glabella originally was in humans. It's that thing right between your eyebrows. Um, and it gets its name because it doesn't have hair. I know. Mine has hair. Tough break. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and uh, it refers to the central portion of the, of the headpiece when it refers to a trilobite. That there'll be the eyes on either side, there'll be the thing between them, and then there'll be the rest of the head shield. And in fake cops, that glabella extends all the way to the front and is giant. Um, but 
Uh, most other trilobites, it's smaller. And we'll, we'll see some pictures of trilobites where you can get a, a picture. The glabella apparently contains the stomach up in it, as far as we can tell. Multiple specimens of both species contain the preserved uh, under the glabella, a structure which had not been, has not been observed in trilobites this old, despite numerous examples of trilobite gut traces from other Cambrian Lagerstätten. In addition, at least one specimen of Paleolinus uh, lantanoisi shows the preservation of an unusual combination of digestive structures, a crop and paired digestive glands along the elementary tract. This combination of digestive structures can also has never been observed in trilobites this old and is rare in general, with prior evidence of it from one juvenile trilobite specimen from the late Cambrian Orsten, Orsten fauna of Sweden, and possibly one adult trilobite specimen from the er, early Ordovician uh, Fezuata Lagerstate. You see, uh, it's possible because they really can't do that. So, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Well, we now have extraordinary evidence, so the claims are backed up. Uh, why are they extraordinary? Because they violate an evolutionary premise, and that is that things evolve in a rational way. The variation in the fidelity of preservation of digestive structures within and across different Lagerstätten may be d due to uh, variations in the type, quality, and point of digestion of food among specimens in addition to differences in mode of preservation. The presence and combination of these digestive features in the Guanshan trilobites contradicts current models of how the trilobite digestive system was structured and evolved over time. Most notably, the crop is not a derived structure as previously proposed, although it is possible that the relative size of the crop increased over evolutionary history of the clade. So maybe there has been evolutionary development after all, but just it wasn't as much as we thought it was at first. Introduction. Although trilobite fossil record is rich in terms of diversity and abundance, most species are known only from certain heavily mineralized exoskeletal sclerites. Non-mineralized parts, including appendages and organ systems, are preserved only under exceptional conditions and thus are known for only a very small fraction of the species. For example, Traces of the digestive system are known for no more than 42 species of the almost 2,000 species known to date. 20,000, I'm sorry. Uh, so what you, you know, the 42 species, that's, they got that from the article. It's there. I, I assume that um, actually there's, they have more in their uh, picture, so um, for most of these species, reconstruction of the digestive system is based on only one specimen. That is, most of the time you can't even see it. And every once in a while you see. Uh, the most commonly preserved structure is the elementary canal, which runs the length of the thorax along the axis. In several of these species, the elementary canal has lobe-like features that do not extend to the genal regions of the trilobite. That's in the abdomen. Uh, these have been interpreted as digestive glands or paired metameric lateral expansions of the digestive tract. <clears throat> wow. Also called digestive cecae, midgut glands, or di gut diverticula. But there's a reference there that says there is a distinction between glands and diverticula in Cambrian lobopodians. And you really shouldn't call them diverticula. More rarely, there is evidence of an expanded region of the canal under the glabella. This has been interpreted as a stomach or crop. The taxa with the most compelling evidence for a crop, such as uh, DNA species Goldfussi and Wendorfia mutabilis, do not appear to have digestive glands. As a result, it has been hypothesized that there are two main digestive systems in trilobites, one with a crop and simple elementary canal, and one with a canal characterized by digestive glands under the cranidium, the medial sclerite of the head shield, 
which also would be known as the glabella, and along at least some of the thoracic segments. Thus far, there have been two possible exceptions to this pattern. The first is that juvenile, tentatively assigned to the genus uh, Sphaerothalamus. The specimen was imaged using synchrotron radiation X-ray tom tomography. We're getting really fancy here. And as a result, the authors were able to discern delicate features such as a J-shaped esophagus, indicating that the mouth was ventrally and posteriorly directed. The mouth actually stuck backwards. Uh, they also located a relatively large expanded region, which they interpreted as the crop, and several pairs of lobe-like extensions on the alimentary canal, which they interpreted as digestive glands. Sort of like what we have here, except that those glands went forward instead of sideways. Now think about that. That was done with special tools. What it means is, maybe some of those simple, gland, uh, simple tubes were not simple. They just had the, the gland sticking forward and nobody's ever done this fancy X-ray uh, tomography using synchrotron radiation. If they had, they would have discovered that the adults have them too. But see, if we think we've got it sewed up, we don't have to look very hard. Some doubt has been raised of the latter interpretation. Well, maybe that's not really, um, those aren't really glands and a crop at the same time. Primarily because the lobes project ventrally rather than lateral dorsally as in adult trilobites, you see. So if it was really there, it would be sticking forward. How do you know you've never looked at the adults? Even if they are digestive glands, I mean, can you hear the skepticism coming through? You see, you're telling us stuff that doesn't fit standard evolutionary theory. <clears throat> Even if they are digestive glands, the fact that the specimen represents an early growth stage, early marapsid, has kept open the possibility that the crop decreased over in relative size over ontogeny, in which case the two type model based on adult morphologies would still be valid. The second is the remains of the digestive system in an adult specimen of the trilobite Megastopsis, um, Echorapsis, if you prefer, Hammondi, from the uh, early Ordovician, uh, Fezuata Lagerstatte. In this specimen, the putative crop is narrow, taking up only one quarter of the width of the glabella, so you, you know, it's bigger, but not very much bigger similar in width to the alimentary uh, tracts spanned by the gut diverticula. The adult specimens with the most compelling evidence for a crop or with enlarged glabellas and muscle scars that may have supported a crop are from geologically younger species, post-Cambrian. Because of this, it has been suggested that the digestive system characterized by a crop and simple alimentary canal may be more derived evolutionarily than the digestive system characterized by digestive glands. See, so you have this kind in lower Cambrian, you have this kind in the upper Cambrian, and then now you have this kind in the Ordovician and the Silurian and the Devonian. And so those evolved later. You see how the evolutionary time scale, or if you prefer the standard geological time scale, figures into how people are interpreting the biology of these creatures. Here we, we report on multiple specimens of two trilobite species from the Guanshan biota, Cambrian series two, early stage four, that show compelling evidence for a crop in one species, Elichi mens mensuyi, Resser et Endo, 1937, complicated name. Um, Resser et Endo are apparently the people who've discovered this creature. The crop is located under the anterior region of a glabella, even though it narrows anteriorly. It kind of points a little bit. The other species, Paleolinus uh, 
Lantanoisi from Matsuyi in 1912 also has digestive glands. Both the presence of the crop in early trilobites and the association of the crop with the narrow glabella and digestive glands contradicts previous conclusions drawn about the structure of trilobite digestive system and its evolution. By the way, the Chinese are not necessarily friends of evolution, so they're, they're kind of happy to stick it to you, although Melanie Hopkins is maybe risking her career on this. Uh, as long as she's a faithful evolutionist, they might let it pass. The Guanshan biota. Guanshan biota is a Burgess shale type fossil biota, like the Burgess shale. Soft body fossils range from Paleolinus biozone to the mega Paleolinus biozone of the regional Kenglan Puan state of southern China. The Guanshan biota is thus slightly younger than the celebrated Chengjing biota. Some of you may have heard of that. Um, older than the uh, Kaili uh, fauna in Guizhou and temporarily equivalent to the Baleng fauna in Guizhou, the Shipai fauna in Hubei, the Sinkst biota in Siberia, and the Emu Bay shale biota in South Australia. So you can see there's uh, you know, quite a few of these things around and it, it's it's not the earliest, that would be Qingjiang, but it's one of the earliest. And they go through listing a whole bunch of other places that, uh, that this uh, stuff is uh, uh, equivalent to. Burgess shale type exceptional preservation has been the focus of considerable research, particularly the eponymous site in southwestern Canada, Burgess shale, of course, and the Qingjiang biota of South China. Those are apparently the earliest. Uh, Chengjiang is even earlier, I think, than uh, Burgess Shale. The taphonomy of the Guangsheng biota is most similar to that of the Chengjiang biota. That is how it was buried, the stuff it was buried in. Both the Chengjiang and Guangshan biotas are unusual among Burgess Shale type fossils for having limited pyritization of non mineralized features. You don't get a lot of iron pyrites replacing stuff. Skipping on materials and methods, specimens were collected from the lower Cambrian Wulong Qing, uh, Qing, I don't know, I'm sure, not sure how you pronounce that in, in uh, Chinese, formation in the Gaolu Fang section near Gangwei village in southern Kunming, the capital city of Yunnan province of China, during a collecting campaign of 10 local people organized by Zi Zhang, that's the last author, during the spring of 2014 to the autumn of 2015. So you just got some people, hey, let's go fossil hunting, and they went. The fossils were recovered from a 40 to 50 meter thick, fine grain laminated mudstone, occasionally intercalated with thin layers of siltstone or sandstone. Abundant silt mud couplets with normal grading now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that means that they were probably laid as a single layer uh, mini uh, turbidite. Is that right? Each grading unit would be one event. Yeah, yeah. So you have these little mini turbidites coming through, laying stuff down, and then uh, when it settles out, it, it grades. Um, so this is geologically relatively fast de deposition. It wouldn't have preservation if it wasn't fast. You mean those things can't sit at the bottom of the ocean for thousands of years while the sediment piles up? How many crabs that die on the seashore here are preserved at present? Not too many. Um, so there's this, there's this evidence of rapid preservation, uh, both the, the, the critters themselves and the stuff they're laying in. Um, they're, anyway, those, those couplets with normal uh, grading are commonly observed within the mudstone layers containing the trilobite fossils. 
Uh, moving on a little further, skipping a paragraph. The results, I'm going to not gonna put the results themselves up. I'm going to let you see the pictures because they, this is one of those cases where the Chinese proverb is accurate. A picture is worth a thousand words. And again, uh, we'll skip it down to the discussion in a little bit, uh, the part of the discussion that I find most interesting. But first, here are some pictures. This one you probably recognize. Uh, I'm going to enlarge this area here so that you'll be able to see it. But here you can see this is what they think is the crop. And this they're questioning whether this is actually a gland right there or not. But they're pretty sure this one is a gland, that one is a gland, that one is a gland, and so forth. Um, now, here is one that shows the crop but not much else except that if you look very carefully, you can see antennae on it. Um, here's one that has a crop and what looks like a fairly smooth digestive, uh, it'd be interesting to ask whether maybe that's a gland too and people are just ignoring it. But in any case, here's the enlargement and here you can see where the, uh, where the glands used to be apparently. Um, uh, this is, by the way, um, all the uh, uh, accuracy that the, uh, that the pictures that are in the article will allow. I've blown it up to where what you see is one pixel per their pixel. And you can see it's pretty de detailed. Interestingly, it has, a, it has a little horn at the back of this thing. This one appears to be buried, so they haven't completely gotten it clean. Uh, maybe that got rounded off. And here's uh, four more of these things, and you can see that they all have a pretty decent crop. This little part right here is the glabella. The eyes will be outside of that. Uh, and you can see that the crop is, contain is under most of the glabella. And here you can see some other ones with crops. So there's a whole bunch of, of uh, a trilobites, uh, and quite a few of them now with crops. Um, you can't really see, you can try to imagine that the uh, gut is running through here, but you really can't see much of it. Certainly not as clearly as you'd like to. This is one where I'd like to have one of these things and run it through one of those fancy CAT scanners and see what you see. But to give you some idea of the numbers of critters you have. Here is wall-to-wall -wall trilobites with um, uh, crops in quite a few of them. Looks like there's, well, that's not, that's a defect there. But you can see just all over the place. This one maybe has one, but it hasn't quite broken through the, the carapace yet. It seems like crops are everywhere. It's just that somewhere they are actually revealed. I, I think you're right. I don't think th I think they all have crops. It's just that you can't always see them. And I bet you, if you were to take one of these things and put it through, you'd find that the stomach was there. They have brains. What? Did they have brains? Uh, yes, um, and in fact, they've found nervous systems on some of these uh, in in a different contexts. In order to find that, you have to do a little bit different uh, uh, taking them apart. You know, there's so many of these things. It'd be interesting to see. Uh, um, he turns it on up there. Yeah, otherwise, he leaves it quiet. Uh, we, we'd like to have a little uh, comment. Yeah, now you're ready. Go ahead. Hold it up close to you. Testing, one, two, three. There you go. Go ahead. I just asked her about the brain. Oh, yeah, the brain is uh, the brain is there too, um, but it's harder to demonstrate. Apparently, the gut basically rotted through the top of the shell in some cases, and so that made it easier to find. And in other cases, got stained with iron oxide. I have a question. Uh, yes, just a minute. Uh, we want to get your. Can you hold that up to her? It does. It, it does. Oh, there it is. 
I'm just taken with how efficient they are. Everything seems to be right up there at the top and then down and out. And it just, what an efficient little thing it is. Yeah. Well, uh, that has been noted by a number of people that when trilobites first appear, they're fully formed. And now we're finding out their guts were fully formed too. Um, there doesn't appear to be significant evolution. I mean, you can find evolution in terms of change, but if anything, some of it may be degeneration, or some of it may be that we just haven't looked hard enough, and all those other ones with the straight guts actually have glands that are coming in from the bottom, and nobody's bothered to check that with their fancy uh, synchrotron radiation CAT scans. Yes. Of course, uh, one of the most astounding uh, f discoveries about trilobites that uh, speaks of uh, being well developed is the correction for spherical aberration in the lenses of um, some of these trilobites, not the very bottom ones, but how in the world can you have uh, you use a very special lens for spherical aberration, and it's, it's, it has that lens there to correct that, which is incredible. How, how'd that develop all of a sudden? Well, it didn't develop all of a sudden. It developed gradually, and each little correction was... Uh, <laughs> You'd expect to find a fossil record of that if that had happened. Yes, you would. Yes, you would. Why is the ones at the bottom seem to have just as good eyes as the ones at the top? But how are you going to develop gradually a lens so it corrects for cycle aberration uh, unless you have a, a, some survival value for the parts, uh, for the times you try that it doesn't work? I know, I know. Um, I noticed there is a bar in that figure. Uh, could you tell us what that bar I, I, represents? I would have to look it up, but I think that's a five uh, millimeter bar or something like, or five centimeter bar. Um, so well, these things are... Because it matters, I, I understand that trilobites range in size greatly. And yes. And you see, to have a very large organism, you have to have a fully developed uh, GI tract and, and a fully developed metabolic system and circulatory system and everything else to supply a body that size. There right. is simply no, no right. other way to organize it. Right. Uh, and, and the nervous system to communicate with all of mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. um, and the trilobites appear in the fossil record ready to go doesn't look like there's any experimental stuff and we're finding out it's true with their guts too. The Guanshan material is the first convincing evidence for a crop in early Cambrian trilobites. The frequency with which the crop is represented by an iron oxide line cavity pro provides a new search image for this part of the digestive system in fossil specimens. Only once before has a cavity been interpreted as a crop Um, Fatka et al. noted a similar depression in the anterior part of the glabella of Bermanites engines, but concluded, but conclude that while this cavity represents space enclosed by the hypostome, it cannot represent a crop because there is no obvious preservation of the digestive tract between this space and where it is visible in the thorax. How's that for logic? Uh, maybe going a little bit beyond the evidence. Similarly, it is also possible that the cavities in the anterior part of the glabella in three specimens of uh, Basilicus uh, caldazi from the Izagirini formation of Morocco, I hope I got that right, represent the remains of the crop in this species. In addition to one specimen of Bas uh, Basilicus uh, caldazi, show a pair of small circular cavities on either side of the elementary canal at the anteriormost axial segment, and another fainter pair within the glabella. That sounds like digestive glands, right? 
Although preservation is not good enough to be conclusive, Basilicus uh, caldazi may be another example of a trilobite with both crop and digestive glands. You see how if you've got a theory and it seems to fit what you're expecting, that you can look at stuff and not see it because you know what you're supposed to see. Yeah. You don't know what you're looking for, you don't find it. That's right. Well, somebody said I wouldn't have seen if it if I hadn't believed it. <laughs> As such, there is now evidence for this digestive system in at least four species spanning the Cambrian, and they'll list the four species that we just read about. Gutierrez, Marco, and colleagues interpreted the combination of a crop and digestive glands in Megistopsis, or Echiraspis hammondi, to be a new type three trilobite digestive system. However, we suspect that at least some previously previous classifications may have been misled by taphonomic variability. That is, after they were buried, or while they were being buried, and after they started to rot and stuff, uh, taphos uh, is a Greek for grave, if that helps you any. Um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, that sometimes they would decay in one way, sometimes they would decay in another way, and you could get fooled if you assumed that they were all decaying exactly alike. Um, in addition to the relatively small number of specimens, 16% of Paleolina specimens and 5% of Relichia specimens, that show gut trace preservation in the Guanshan material, there is considerable variation in the fidelity of gut trace preservation among specimens, despite having been collected from the same outcrop. But you know they all had guts, because otherwise they couldn't have grown to the size they were. Inconsistent preservation was also observed among specimens of Bonellus engines from Sirius uh, Passe. Uh, Lynn went so far as to suggest that when the elementary canal was preserved in uh, Linoides paraptus, paired axial markings were not visible and vice versa. In other words, one feature was always preserved at the exclusion of the other. But presumably they both had both, it's just the way they decayed. In individual specimens, it is possible that different concentrations of sediment and organic material along the digestive tract, depending on what they were eating, could result in differential preservation of different regions. And there are some people who have suggested that. You'll see three references given there. Thus, even under the same taphonomic conditions, differential preservations would be a natural consequence of individual variation in the type and quantity of food, as well as the point in digestion of that food at death and burial. This emphasizes the importance of multiple specimens for describing the digestive system of a species. You can't just rely on one specimen. It may not be preserved. Once you think about it, it's almost, well, duh, the preservation of a crop in two early Cambrian stage four trilobites of different taxonomic orders indicates that the presence of the crop is not only a feature of geologically younger trilobites as previously suggested. Oops. However, the crops in Paleolinus lantanoisi and Relichia are no larger than the anterior part of the glabella, which is relatively narrow in both species and even narrows anteriorly in red lychia. Taxa with expanded glabella could have accommodated a much larger crop, for example, phacops, in which case there may, be, there may still be evolutionary trends toward relatively larger crops over time. May. Got to preserve evolutionary theory somehow. Now, my own take on all this is, evolutionary theory likes to arrange fossils from simple to complex and to find the complex uh, fossils higher in the record, which means that they're later. Now, I'm not sure that paired digestive glands and trilobites are really simpler than a crop. 
Um, but at least one could argue that there was a linear progression and maybe we just don't understand the, the simplicity, the complexity of it. As more specimens were found, the theory seemed to be strained. But it, you could write off one specimen as a juvenile and another as Artivician and not early and still preserve your theory. It looks like we finally hit the breaking point and the whole theory needs to be rethought. The most complicated guts, crop and side glands seem to be fairly early and I bet you that if you did one of those little synchrotron things you'd find out that the that there were some specimens with a crop and digestive glands in the Chang-Jiang formation. Just nobody's really looked. Uh, the record of trilobite guts seems to be one of early complication with, if anything, later degeneration, which is precisely the opposite of what would be predicted by standard evolutionary theory. You know, things get better and better with time. Presumably more complex. And I'd offer that maybe standard evolutionary theory isn't that good. Now, intelligent design could account for the complexity early on and might even predict a creation followed by degeneration. But frankly, intelligent design makes few predictions, making it a less satisfying theory from a scientific point of view. You'd really like to have a theory that makes more predictions. Um, maybe I should explain that. You see, good theory in science has to have three main properties. Number one, it makes predictions. If you don't make predictions and you're not really a scientific theory. And just to give you an example, in two months the planet that we're looking at will be in position A relative to the stars and not B, C, D or any other position. That is a requirement of a scientific theory. If you don't make predictions, you can't test it, it's not useful even if it's right, it's not useful. Okay. Second one is the predictions are correct. Okay. We look at the planet in two months and sure enough it's in position A and not in position B or C or D. Uh, so you have to make predictions, you have to make correct predictions and finally the predictions make some kind of sense. These predictions correspond to a theory, for example, of gravitation. Even before gravitation you had, well, they correspond to an orbit. They correspond to an orbit around perhaps the Earth with epicycles or something like that to try to make them actually match. Or perhaps they correspond to an orbit around the Sun. Well, maybe you have to have epicycles for that too, but not as many because one of the epicycles is taken care of by the Earth-Sun movement. And um, in fact, if you're really good, you say, well, why bother with epicycles? Um, ellipses make the orbit completely correct. Um, and then somebody says, well, you know, this would all work if things had an inverse square law attraction rule such as gravitation. And that's when a scientific theory finally completely congeals. When it has a theory behind it, the theory will make predictions and the predictions turn out to be correct. That is a really good scientific theory. Intelligent design unfortunately makes few predictions. Most of what it makes are more suggestions than predictions. There are a few things that it does predict. And one of them is that you can tell that natural evolution can't account for some things. Um, the same, although that criticism, criticism of intelligent design is true and even more so, as we're discovering now, for evolution. Because here's a case where evolutionary predictions clearly were not met. And yet, none of the people are saying we need to th rethink whether evolution is true. They go to say we need to think how evolution works. You see? This isn't enough to destroy evolution. And why is that? Because evolution is a theory that is totally plastic. Well, mostly plastic. I think that eventually it does reach a breaking point. It just takes a long time to do so. 
but if you can always account for the data, what that means is your theory really doesn't predict anything with any security. And so even if it were true, it's not a useful theory. Now the question is, can creation do any better than these two? Well, now I'm going to add this. this. This is a dangerous game. The same predictions that can earn a theory credit if they're right can damage it severely if they're not right. But I'm going to say this, live a little dangerously just for fun. Okay? <laughs> Creation generally predicts that animals will be created with exquisitely designed internal and external organs that then degenerate with time. That's what you'd expect. There may be a few exceptions, for example, thorns that are created that seem to be perfectly designed for thorns that come after the original creation and offensive weapons. And there's another possible exception if the ancients were able to do either indirect or direct genetic engineering. So maybe we're looking at some things that might get better, if you want to call it that, in addition to the things that might get worse from a Edenic point of view. Um, when the flood comes, it buries populations essentially simultaneously. There may be three days difference between the different, or maybe even three months difference between the different um, uh, trilobites. But they're all going to be buried in pretty much the same year. Okay? Not a lot of evolution is going to take place during that year. The only gradation that you'd have would be from deep sea to shallow sea to land, which is essentially kind of a gross ecological zonation. Okay? One might expect creatures with complicated guts to be mixed in with creatures with simpler guts of varying types without an obvious layer or what would be interpreted as time in the standard model difference. So you kind of expect the same you know, same kind of guts in the earlier as in the later. And now we're finding out you have them. Furthermore, the complicated guts come early. It looks like that's what we have with trilobite guts. Now, skeptics will argue that this is only one data point and they'll be correct. This is not the magic bullet that slays evolution. One of the reasons I'm bringing this to your attention is to point out that this is not an isolated incident. We've been talking about other areas where you see this same kind of strain. You know, any one point can be explained away. But if you keep finding these anomalies all throughout the fossil and modern world, eventually they have to have some kind of weight. And eventually, I think that evolution as a theory has a hard time sustaining itself. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes. Um, I'm not sure in, in the context of uh, your comment, which uh, is very correct, that um, no matter what you find, you have an evolutionary explanation for it. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, intelligent design is uh, that much less weaker. Uh, it's true we don't know how creation occurred and all these things. Right, um, and, and but especially we're not even talking about creation, we're talking about um, 15, 1,600 years, maybe 2,000 years after creation, and, uh, and, and, and then the, the biota at that time suddenly getting buried. I could, I could uh, when I look at the fossil record, you know, I, I could say, well, if I was a creationist, I'd predict that there'd be great gaps between major types, 
Yes. Uh, and if I was an evolutionist, I'd say, no, they shouldn't be there. And you look at the data, and I think uh, the creation argument wins out there in that one. Well, but <clears throat> you see, evolution doesn't really predict that, because Stephen Jay Gould and uh, Niels Eldridge predicted uh, uh, that there should be gaps between them because the the where they were actually doing the evolving it disappeared yeah no but the, the Gould and Eldridge prediction though was uh, at the species and generic level maybe family and does not get involved into the macro evolutionary thing at all uh, well so they, so, they wouldn't draw a line between micro and micro so, evolution uh, uh, I think uh, the creation prediction uh, tends to hold up there in terms of the fossil record. Uh, yeah. Now the interesting thing is that virtually everybody agrees the dogs came from wolves. Or, or the, the wolves and dogs had a common ancestor. And that means that there has been some change, and if you want to call that evolution, you can call that evolution. Now, there are reasons for arguing that it's not quite as simple as that, but for right now, uh, let's supposing the dogs and wolves were not known from outside of the fossil record, so we don't have DNA that we can, uh, uh, we can find the precise differences between different types of dogs and between dogs and wolves. The interesting thing is that there is, in fact, a series of wolf-like creatures and a series of dog-like creatures, and they eventually do meet. So there has been, again, being careful not to say you have evolution that, that va validates all different kinds. But there is an evolution. There is a change that, that gives us that. But the interesting thing of it is, if we had a worldwide flood right now, we would find a wolf clay that was pretty tight. Perhaps uh, gray wolves and red wolves, and then we would have, uh, and then we would have dogs, and all the intermediates would be gone. Now, having said that, what I what I'm basically saying is this that the fact that the fossil record shows species that are relatively distinguishable from each other and don't grade into each other is actually an artifact of preservation. Um, difference between dogs and cats, whole different animal. Pardon the expression. Well, that, and that's, that's where the prediction comes to a real problem right? Uh, is at that level. The thing of it is that the bigger the difference, the more intermediates you should find. That's right, and that's and precisely it, where you don't find them. And it goes exactly the opposite way. And they make a big difference, a big deal about the, the crosses between them, you know. And there are huskies that are half wolf. And uh, I suppose that if you did some genetic work on them, uh, you did some careful anatomical work on them, you could probably say that this particular husky is half wolf, this particular husky is three quarters wolf, and so forth. And so if you, if you had all of that stuff preserved, you could actually get an evolutionary sequence out of it. It wouldn't, of course, be a real evolutionary sequence. Um, it would actually be crossbreeding. But you, you can throw another curve into that, this picture when you look at the macroevolutionary level, and that is that you have more basic types lower down in the fossil record than you have higher up, which is again the opposite of what you would expect from evolution. So yes. an another prediction right. that uh, uh, seems to favor the creation model. Mm -hmm. But as you, as you listen to it, you, you hear that these are soft predictions and that when they don't go their way, they don't say, oh, my, our theory is just completely off, off base. They go, well, our theory needs a little tweaking and we're gonna have to tweak it to include this. 
Because you see, the theory is never allowed to stand on its own. It is never actually testable. And they're frustrated with creationists because we don't make testable predictions. Well, they don't make them either. Not really. If this were a testable prediction, evolution would have failed. But what you have is a very, it's a soft prediction. It's the way they want to see things. And by the way, it's the way because they want to see things, it's the way they do see things until they run into so much evidence they can't, they can't get around it. And this paper is just so much evidence they can't get around it. Before that, they had a juvenile specimen. They should have known. But, you know, the theory was so good that they kind of ignored the evidence. Oh, it's just a kid. He doesn't count. Oh, um, those things stick out front. They can't be glands. And you're just shaking your head, you know. But the, ev but the theory determines what they see. And then when they finally have to see something else, they... Uh, the theory no longer applies. It is, is like is, nobody says, well, maybe we've got the whole thing wrong. Instead, they say, well, you know, we just shouldn't rely on our theory as much, but we're still going to rely on it to tell us where things came from. We tend to believe what we want to believe. This is a two-edged sword, folks. Keep that true. in mind. Uh, but it, uh, too often it dominates the picture. Uh, you need to keep basic facts in mind to try and keep your mind from speculating too much. And uh, I think that's where science can be helpful in interpreting reality. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens when we take uh, some of these specimens and actually do subject them to some of the more modern ways of doing things, uh, x-ray uh, spectroscopy, maybe even flat out anatomical dissection. You know, it's not like we're going to lose all of our specimens. <laughs> I mean, well, there are 10,000 or something like that. Missing one wouldn't really make that much difference, especially if you were to record while we section it off and this is what looks like here and this is why not instead of doing x-ray tomography do just flat out tomography yes i have a really sort of a basic question i've never i've never studied uh, evolution i've just uh, what i know from uh what what oh <laughs> what i just know from studying creationism Okay, my basic question is, if I've talked to an evolutionist, what caused that little animal to develop the stomach? If he had just this thing that went through, what caused, did his brain say, I need a stomach? And, and the guy next to him said, you know, I want one too. I mean, where does this, where does each one of these little, uh, or, or coming up out of the ocean and you suddenly are walking, what happened to the fish say, ooh, I want some legs. Where, where does this come from? I have never heard an answer to that. Is it, a, is it the brain inside the thing itself? Or where do they decide they need, how do they decide they need another appendage or something? Well, uh, of course, what you just said is, total heresy to an evolutionist because the critters don't have enough intelligence to know that they need brains or legs or, or stomachs or whatever. Um, and, and every evolutionist knows this. And so what really happened is that somehow the variations came about and the ones with the better variations were able to live longer, have more kids, who inherited their parents' uh, digestive systems or brains or, or legs or whatever. And so that's, that's the standard story. Now, what is left out from that, uh, actually natural selection does work. If you don't believe that, look at the color of the bears that crawl around on snow in the Arctic. They're all white. 
That's not an accident. But they didn't change from being a bear to something else. They didn't change from being a bear to something else, but the, the point I'm going to make is very simple. I, there are two explanations for why the polar bears are white. Okay, one of them is that the ones that weren't white couldn't catch seals and therefore died out. Another one, which I think is maybe complementary, and there may be uh, both parts of this, not just one, and that is that the bears that were white went hunting um, uh, muskrats or, or uh, woodchucks or whatever and couldn't catch any because they were seen coming. Uh, and, uh, but then when they ventured out onto the ice flows, they found that they could catch seals quite nicely. Thank you. And uh, so they went where the food was available, which means that you don't have to kill them all off. Um, it's, it's, more of a, it's more of a, you know, you live where you're comfortable kind of thing. But it, however that happened, I think that something like that did happen because polar bears are white. Uh, Alaskan brown bears, which they can mate with and have uh, sort of half tan uh, offspring, I mean, you can tell, are kind of, you know, brown, black, uh, nicely camouflaged for hunting woodchucks and not very camouflaged at all for hunting seals. So um, natural selection actually does work. The problem is, how do you get the variations? In the case of polar bears, it's really easy. They're albino. Well, they're partial albino. They have black noses, so they can put out pigment, but they don't put out pigment in the hair because of a mutation. And I'm willing to bet you that if somebody were to do the uh, uh, genetics on it, you could find out which mutations there were in, in, in polar bears and maybe even which mutations in certain populations and other mutations and others that did the same thing. For all we know, polar bears actually, you know, there's Eastern and there's Western in there, or, or maybe there's, you know, three or four different kinds, okay? But all of them have that same feature where the, the fur becomes white. And it becomes white because it doesn't put melanin into the, into the hairs that are growing out. A polar bear doesn't think anything about that. Okay? The polar bear just exists and tries to find food and it gets it wherever it can. Okay? The key to that is that's easy enough for the polar bear. It is horribly difficult to try to get a whale out of a land mammal. The changes are just phenomenal. And what has not been looked at is that natural selection cannot create anything. All it can do is sort out what's already been created. So the, all the creation has to be done by random mutations. And frankly, they're not up to the job. And this is the single weakest point of um, evolutionary theory. And in fact, uh, some people, including Douglas Sachs, have put numbers to that and the numbers are just simply staggering. There haven't been enough c cats in the world and dogs in the world and whatever the supposed precursor was to be able to do the changes that would be necessary to get one group into cats and one group into dogs. And the same thing is probably true of bears the same thing is true of whales. The same thing is true of uh, many mammals. And see, mammals aren't like uh, E. coli that multiplies every 20 minutes, or 10 minutes, I'm told, if you're really good at it. That if you feed them stuff, they will just, just uh, multiply like rabbits is an understatement. And, uh, but 
But when you have elephants, it takes two years to have a kid. You know? What? That's one kid. Yeah, they don't do twins as I understand it. <laughs> and that makes huge generation times. You know, even if mom's ready for another one at the end of that, which probably she needs a few weeks of recovery, um, there's only so many elephant generations that you can have. You know, people, they're not really ready until about, uh, well, nowadays it's gone down to probably close to 10 years. Uh, culturally, of course, that's not thought of as acceptable, but even, you know, 15, 20 years for generation time is still just pushing it hard. Well, there haven't been enough generations to get the kind of changes that go between chimpanzees and humans. And if you really want to see something weird, take a look at the Y chromosome. People, when you start running the numbers, you realize it doesn't work. And that means that the standard evolutionary theory where there's no designer of, what, of ev any kind involved is just asking people to believe that they can win the lottery 50 times in a row. Not going to happen. Not unless your nephew happens to work at the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> this just got me thinking a little bit. You know, when we read the book of Job, in the book of Job, you hear God speaking at the very beginning and then towards the end in chapter 39. And between about chapter 3 and 38, you have all the arguments being bandied back and forth in various permutations, every single combination of ideas that you can imagine and then some. The question that I've been puzzling over is why didn't God immediately in chapter 4 say something? Why did he wait till chapter 39? Until everybody else had shut up. <laughs> Well, you see, the, the idea is if God preempted the whole discussion, how many people would have been convinced? You see, it seems to me that we almost have to run out of ideas. We have to explore everything and come to a wall before it would do any good for God to actually even say anything. Yep. It's only when we come to the wall that we're actually willing to begin to listen, to begin to actually contemplate on a higher level. It's, it's, it's as if the entire great rebellion is about that. We are, in fact, claiming to be willing to do the right thing. We just believe that something else is the right thing to do. And we're not convinced that it's not. And no amount of God saying so will do the trick. We still believe that, yes, but this could work. And so what what is God supposed to do? The only thing he can do is to let us try it out and see how it works out. And at the end of the day, when we have done everything we could possibly do, and then some, when we have exhausted every alternative, then we're finally going to bow and say, yes, Thou art holy and righteous in all your ways. Yes. But sadly, 
What does that say about us? You know, the interesting thing is that Job hit that wall earlier than his friends did. This is the thing that I'm thinking about. You know, he, what does he this goes, attitude yeah. say about yeah. us? Why do we feel so... Uh, how should I say? Use the, 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 it's almost like using a hell-bent to explore every other alternative before doing the right thing. Well, you notice that this has happened. <laughs> you know, jo this happened to Job first. You know, he comes to the place where you know I've always been taught that if you're good, you get rewarded; if you're bad, you get punished. Right. And uh, he, he says, says that. But I've been good. I, I, I don't understand and, this. And I'm being punished, and it doesn't fit. And then he goes on to speculate about, well, God's still good. There must be an afterlife. I don't know exactly how it works, but yet in, even though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. And it will be my eyes and not somebody else's. And that's, that's Job. His friends don't fall to this idea until at the very end uh, when, um, when God speaks to them out of the whirlwind. Uh, and Job is told, now Job got it right, even though you're going, how did he do that? You know, But apparently it is, it is where God wants to make a point and Job is willing to listen before anybody else is. That the prosperity gospel, to be, put it bluntly in modern terms, is false. Um, you know, if you do the right thing, God will give you uh, a nice wife or husband, depending on what sex you are, and a, and a wonderful marriage, and a, and a house, and a car, and you know, you know the, the standard stuff. But, but how is that theory any different from survival of the fittest? Not a whole lot. It's just, it's just different not, terminology. You're, 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 you're fitter in a certain way. It's just different terminology. But, but the other interesting... Religious and the other one atheist. The other interesting thing is you see this same phenomena happening here. They are trilobites. They've got an evolutionary theory, simple to complex. Well, okay, so the, the glands are more complex than the simple crop, but Maybe we just got it wrong and the crop is harder to do biochemically or something. So we still have glands to crop. And then you see specimens that have crops that should fit. And you have specimens that, uh, that, that are early. Uh, but that's a juvenile that doesn't count. Oh, uh, but that's... Um, no, it couldn't be. Those are not really, really glands. And, and, and you go through all of these things to try to avoid it, and then finally it hits you in the face, and oh my, we have to rethink how evolution works. Maybe we have to think, rethink evolution itself. But it's hard for people to do that, and they wait until the evidence is overwhelming. And in the meantime, they keep telling us that the evidence is overwhelming. But that's, anyway, I hope this was um, of some help to you. Very good. I, I still don't have the answer in, in where they, they come up with uh, the mechanism. You know, I how- They don't how have one most of the time, to be <laughs> blunt. Or even the, the need. It's, it, it's supposedly, it's a need that it that has, and where does it? Like I say, they don't, they don't deal with needs. No. Not until we get to humans who, who actually can sense a need. Yeah. Um, well, listen, a mother, a, a mother with children needs three arms. <laughs> Why with not that, four? With, <laughs> yes, yeah. you are right. And she needs eyes in the back of her head, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. My kids thought my ears go back there. Yeah. So there is some evolutionary selection right there. 
<laughs> Have a safe trip. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see you next week.